another bit of the Startcom podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is documentary producer Charlie Phillips. Welcome to the show. Hello, nice to be here. Indeed, indeed. Not only are you a documentary producer, you're also head of stories at Lifter, a platform created to support teachers in tackling complex themes and topics. And you're a programmer at Folkestone Documentary Film Festival as well. That's right. Yeah, I do multiple different jobs because that's the life of the freelancer. So I I like to say that I'm a documentary producer because that is the thing that I spend most of my time doing, trying to get funding for the documentaries I'm producing and trying to help them get to the right place creatively, um, such as the state of the documentary industry, that that's not necessarily the thing that brings in the most money for me. So, uh, and I'm also quite a restless person as well. So I like to be doing multiple different things at once. And that's where the documentary festival here in Folkestone, where I live, comes in, um, which I program. And I'm also the artistic director for, which basically means that I program the films. It's quite a grand title. Um, And then also do Lifter, which is an educational platform that brings documentaries to kids um and yeah i just i just love documentaries so i try and approach it from as many different aspects as possible in my life okay well let's let's start at the beginning then of a process of documentary i mean i'm a screenwriter so i know i know i know how a scripted film starts in terms of someone's got to either have some intellectual property or create intellectual property you can then turn into a screenplay that can be produced into a film and depending on the whys and wherefores of what you write will attract or not attract a certain level of money in the market or none at all. So when you're when you're looking at the marketplace or looking at filmmakers to work with, what kind of documentary are you looking to make? Because obviously they, they while they can be cheaper to shoot, they can often take longer to shoot. Yeah, I mean I I've always worked in documentaries. Um prior to what I'm doing now, I was a commissioner of short documentaries and I've also worked at documentary festivals. So I have seen a lot of documentaries and I'm quite precise in what I like, which is the observational documentary. So I really love films where you're going to see a story unfolding in front of you without too much intervention from a filmmaker. So the style of the directors I like to work with is... Generally, that they're a verite filmmaker, so they like to go and they like things to unravel in front of them. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a fly on the wall, because that's just not a thing that really exists in life. Like a director has an impact on the people in their films. But generally, I love to work with directors who have a very relaxed relationship with their people on screen. So they feel relaxed enough to just open up about their lives and just do the things that they're going to do. So from a style point of view, that's very much what I look for. But I also really love to work with like visionary documentary makers who come with a very particular style. So one of the directors I'm working with, Jeannie Finlay, um, we're doing a film about the northeast of England. And she has, I think this is her, I think it's her ninth feature doc, might even be more than that, but she's made a lot of feature docs and In all of her films, there's a very kind of glossy, creative approach. She's very empathetic towards her contributors, but there's always this very lush visual feeling in what she does. She's very good at using natural elements in her films. There's a really great use of colour. So she's got a very definite creative approach where you can tell what a Jeannie Finlay film is. Looks like another of the directors I'm working with, Jesse Gutch, who is making a film about Folkestone, where I live. Um, She always brings a kind of hybrid approach. So she does beautiful observational work, but she's also great at making constructed scenes that are on the borderline of documentary and drama because she's also a drama filmmaker. And so... I look for those really exciting creative approaches mm. as well as a subject that I'm really interested in. Yeah. Um, it's important to me to be working in a subject that I care about and that I think is going to make a difference to people's lives. So it's a lot of different things, but so much of it is just led by wanting to work with directors that I think are really cool. 
One of the things there about that idea of observational, again, because it's unscripted, it's, it's all very well to be relaxed and, and, and observant, but then how the, hell, how the hell can you have any confidence you'll ever have a film? You know, we could, we could observe lots of things, but it won't create a narrative. So how, how does the planning of a documentary give you confidence? I mean, obviously, there's a, a, a track record like Jenny's got, that's not a, it's not a question of her talent. It's more like the, I'm trying to get into the head of like, when you go into producing a, a, a documentary, how can you be confident there's a story going to emerge? Yeah, it is a gamble. Okay. Because you get really excited about a story mm. and you have this sense of how the story could unfold on screen mm. and speak to the director a lot about what is likely to happen, what the contributors have told you, where this could take you. You write, you know, reams and reams of material for a funding application about what the end point of the film is going to be. But yeah. you really don't know. I mean, everything could everything could go wrong. The story could go away. The character could turn out to not be as engaging as you thought they might be. I mean, mm. there is risk, but you get, you with experience, you learn that if a character is being honest with you and mm. they are, they've let you into their life, they are telling you what is likely to happen in their life. You have a rapport with them where they're going to give you a heads up when something interesting is going on. Then you tend to get that really interesting material that you can weave into a film. Yeah. Like I wouldn't really get involved in a story if I didn't think there was an actual story there, if I didn't think there was going to be an end point that was going to be really interesting. Yeah. Because I'm really into story-based filmmaking. I mean, that said, the Folkestone film that I'm doing, it does have stories in it, but it's quite a concept-led film. It's a, it's a film, it's called Border Town. It's about the idea of the borders that we create around our identities, mm. as well as the border in Folkestone on the English Channel. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting one because I really love that kind of filmmaking as well, where you come with quite a concept-led approach. And with that film, we've sort of cast different characters around town who have their own interesting mini stories that we're going to follow. Mm. But the sort of whole of the film is going to be quite concept-led. And when you're making that sort of film... Because you're sort of creating the idea that the stories are fitting into. Yeah. You can be a lot more confident that you're going to be able to put something together that is going to work as a coherent piece of filmmaking. Actually, that kind of filmmaking and that kind of producing is a bit more like fiction producing. Not that I've ever done that. But it is more like fiction producing or fiction screenwriting because you're being more constructed in how you fit the different pieces together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know from people who've pitched sort of documentary TV stuff, you know, you kind of sunned until I die and things like that, where as part of the pitch, you kind of create a, a fictional narrative of a character that exists, but you don't know that that's strong. Like, to give the people you are commissioning this kind of thing an idea of where it could go. So it'd be like, you know, Phyllis yeah. is a cleaner. She's a, she's been at the club for fifty years. You know, da, 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 da. you can create a picture for people that they can they can run away with without you needing to film that. But you can, but you might not get that when you make the film. I mean, it's no guarantee. Yeah, you might not get exactly that, but you'll get something that sort of fills that gap. And so, like with Border Town, we've got like six main characters, and then and about six sort of secondary characters. And we spoke to about 50 different people mm. around town. And it wasn't as cynical as this, but we were sort of going, you know, we really want someone who's representing the queer scene. We really mm. want a politician. We really want a fisherman. You know, we want these like different kinds of people. Yeah. And as long as you know you're going to get someone who represents a particular worldview mm. and is doing a particularly interesting set of things then you you really want that first person that you've spoken to but if you didn't get that person you got someone else who fills that particular gap then with that kind of film you it's not that people are interchangeable but you can kind of know you're going to be able to deliver to a funder what you say mm -hmm. well with the film i'm making with genie that's more of a kind of singular observational story where 
you have to work with specific people because they're involved in that story. Yeah. It has to happen in a particular place. You have no control over the timeline. You have no control over the end point. And so there's a bit more of a gamble there. Yeah. But then you know you're going to end up with a film with really interesting people on the screen. Um, you know you're filming with people who were engaged in a kind of battle for their livelihoods. Mm. So something interesting is going to come out of that, even if you have to ultimately stop filming before everything was totally resolved. I was going to say, I'm mean, going to say with that kind of project, how who calls yeah. time? You know, it depends on what's going on in your life. Really, <laughs> that's the sort of <laughs> banal answer. That like sometimes you with a documentary, you make it for years and you wait for it to get yeah. to a next point that it's going to resolve in. Mm. Sometimes you just have to stop filming because you have to move on to another project. And if you've got to a point that feels like an acceptable end point where you're getting the ideas across, you've got enough of a story, then sometimes you have to call time. Also, sometimes you are working for a broadcaster who has given you a very specific date to deliver to them. Or there's a hook that you want it to be released at cinemas to, to hit. Or there's a yeah. festival you want to hit. And sometimes that dictates things like kind of depends who's funding it. And unfortunately it's hard to get funding for documentaries mm. and that difficulty in getting funding means that you often don't have someone calling the shots. And that's when you can just end up filming forever. Yeah, it can actually yeah. be quite helpful to have a commissioner who is bashing you over the head and telling you, you have to hit, a, you have to hit a deadline because then you sort of have to finish the film. Yeah. 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 I'm, I've, I've interviewed um, Sarah Moses, who's a, producer of documentaries yeah, and, I know Sarah, yeah. and one, one of her things is that well a main thing about what she does is about is about the impact of a documentary as much as it is about the potential profitability and and in a way and what I learned from her was you know that that um that some of the funds out there for documentaries are not even looking to profit from it in a way in a traditional way that an investor in film might look at the commercial potential they're going how much will this money help reach an audience we haven't reached yet with the message about, you know, I mean, one of the ones was, was about elderly people playing ping pong and it was about promoting the idea of act healthy activities for the elderly and not just, the, you know, letting them sit in chairs, you know, that kind of thing. And suddenly that suddenly has a big impact in terms of promoting, you know, fitness and health with people over the age of 80, which is not a normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Sarah's really pioneered a lot of that stuff and, mm. Um, she used to work at the Doc Society and the Doc Society have been real thought leaders in this country in bringing that idea of documentary impact, which sort of originated in the USA. They've mm. really brought it over to these shores. And I think it's really important to have that audience strategy right from the start of making a film to think about who you imagine sitting in a cinema or you know, switching on their laptop mm. to watch. Um, funders ask for that now anyway, but it's not just a tick box exercise. I think it affects the way that you make the film yeah. to imagine that range of people who are going to sit down and watch it. It's, it's really important. And to think about the impact it's going to have on their lives. And not every film is a social impact documentary. Mm. I, I think it's totally fine for documentaries to be made that are not going to change the world and are just beautiful works of art. Like documentary mm. is just the kind of, you know, put the work out there and you get the currency exchange of a measurable social change. Like mm. that's not really how the world works and it shouldn't work like that because they are, these are works of art we're talking about just like any film. Mm. But still, I think documentary is a better place than almost any, than any other film genre to really change hearts and minds. And that is the way a lot of audiences watch documentaries. They watch them to be informed and for it to change their lives. And so I'm, I'm really engaged with and invested in that kind of thing. Mm. And another of the films that I am working on this time as an exec producer, um, it's a film called Our Land, directed by Alban Wallace, mm -hmm. which is about the um, right to roam movement and the okay. demand for access to the countryside yeah. and land that is shut off to us at the moment. And that is going to be a very impact led documentary. I like imagine, we yeah. that to feed into the discussion and the debate around 
what level of right to roam we should have, but also to bring opposing people together. So we want to bring together um, right to roam activists, landowners, travellers, um, people who live in the countryside and try and get a discussion going that crosses over uh, like divided identities. And I really think documentary can do that because it's sort of a safe space sitting in the cinema watching a film to then have a moderated debate mm. afterwards. Yeah. But I mean, obviously documentary is, al- is always still governed by whichever way it points the camera. If it points it one way, it can't point at the other, yeah. can it? I remember a brilliant John Pilger one where he literally did a deconstruction of, of how the news was portraying a certain conflict in Central America. And then he showed yeah. you a, a, the same situation, but from a different angle. Yeah. And it completely changed your perspective of it. It was really sort of clever use of, of documentary filmmaking. And, yeah. and and essentially what you're saying, I mean, you're right. There isn't a need for every documentary to sort of hit everyone in the heart and change their mind. Um, there was a Fright Fest, which is, you know, a festival known for horror films. One of its successful films this year, judging by, you know, word of mouth, will be a documentary called Mancunian Man. Now, I'm, you may have guessed from my accent, I'm from Manchester. And it's about a filmmaker from the 80s called Cliff Twemlow, who made a couple of films mm-hmm. and then tried to make a whole lot more that never really led to much success. But somebody's gone and looked into the story of him I mean. and his decade of trying to mm-hmm. make movies. And in a weird way, the story reveals that he was a pioneer without ever having any right in a way to be a pioneer because he was shooting straight onto video because that was the accessible medium that meant there was no yeah. barrier to making it. And that's the kind of thing that later on you think of like dogma and, and and all those kind of movements that happened where that was that was billed as being why they were important. He was ignored for doing the same thing. And yeah. and I and being from Manchester to watch a documentary like that and realize you knew nothing about him. And yet Here's somebody just took the time to tell a story of someone who culturally is very important. That idea of social history in a very min- in a very minutiae way can become much bigger once you, once yeah. you see it in a bit. Once you see other people who've been affected by it and talking about it with fondness, you realise, wow, this man's just force of nature to want to get a film made is a story worth telling. That he did he did that and he and he impacted on like hundreds of people's lives. Even if mm. most of the films never made it anywhere near even a VHS, let alone a cinema. Yeah, there's a really cool strand that's always been around, but particularly intensified in the last few years of documentaries about film culture mm. and about the act of making films, watching films. There was this amazing film, A Bunch of Amateurs, which was doing the rounds last year, Kim yeah. Hopkins' film about Film Society in Bradford. Um, and I think that's really lovely. I think documentaries that celebrate film culture are yeah. really, you know, really special. As well as Maver- I haven't seen that film, but kind of that sort of maverick creator working on their own. I think that's great. But it's, I guess it's a bit like um, what I mean. I don't know if you remember the exhibition Jeremy Della did about folk yeah. archive, where he went and yeah. basically documented through an art gallery exhibition all the little yeah. culture things that were happening that. You wouldn't get as big culture in terms of how we describe what's happening in Britain, but then you put it in an art gallery, suddenly you're shining a light. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a massive fan of Della. Like, Della's my favourite artist, which yeah. I mean, he's a lot of people's favourite artists. And I was actually listening to an interview with him last night because he was on um, Private Passions, which is a Radio 3 um, show, and I was yeah. listening to the podcast a bit. And he was talking about when he won the Turner Prize and how he sort of didn't care initially about the prize, but it was really useful because it meant that he went from this guy who was interested in these weird bits of folk culture and in brass bands and in um, the minor strike and like and all of these things. And people were sort of interested, but skeptical. But then if you're the Turner Prize winning artist, <laughs> everyone's like, oh yes, that's legitimate. That, you know, that's proper, that's fine. You can come in and you can show things here and, you know, suddenly like, oh yeah, brass bands are very important because Jeremy Dell at the Turner Prize winner says <laughs> they're important. And I do think like having a having a documentary made about something legitimizes. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. Whoever the filmmaker is, 
um it, it makes it seem like an important part of history and i think that's quite important yeah and i mean and one of jenny's the sound it out is a prime example of that you know literally a record shop in teesside yeah is is is, is put into film history by the very you know yeah. Canada. Yeah, and she and and she elevated that for an international audience, yeah. and that's something that's really important to me actually in the films that I produce. So most of the films I'm producing are set in the UK. Mm. Um, there's one that's in the US, but most of them are UK stories. And with all of them, they're all based in this country. They're all based locally, but they're all aimed at an international market and an international audience. Because mm. I think it's really important that we celebrate our local places and our local stories and our local communities and give them the respect and the exposure for the rest of the world mm. because like a film about Folkestone and the little communities that live here and especially the working class communities that live here like they really deserve to be seen I think we have a problem in this country with celebrating our small communities celebrating our working class communities no, um, talking about people who are unfashionable like fishermen yeah. and it's not that I think the fishermen here are like you know i don't romanticize them yeah i'm vegan i don't eat their fish yeah, yeah. i think they all voted for brexit i didn't vote for brexit but i think it's really important that we show them to the world because otherwise you get this very strange view of the country that's all Downton Abbey and the royal family and whatever else. Yeah, no, it's like a disease in, in British film that we must live somewhere yeah. in the past. And, yeah, and, yeah. And somebody's upstairs and somebody's downstairs and somebody's a yeah, or, or you get this very grim view of like council estates and everyday life. And and like I went to see Scrapper last mm. week, shot Keegan's film, which I thought was amazing. And she actually, when I was at The Guardian, my previous job, I commissioned her to do this amazing short documentary about kids games on council estates called no ball games hmm. and, and both of that sure i'm um, with scrapper i just think it's really brilliant that she's making a film about where the kind of places she grew up in hmm. that's just like quite positive and fun and silly and so again it's not about romanticizing it it's just about saying like you can show joy in this country that is about like everyday people having some joy. You yeah. just don't really see that. And I just think it's really important that that is an image of the country that we show to the world. No, I totally agree. Because because in a way, working class culture is often either, like you say, very shouty or very problematic. Or yeah. it's somebody who's broken out of being working class and they're now a successful footballer or a gold medalist at the Olympics. Like yeah. there's two extremes. You've either failed or you've broken out. And the yeah. idea that hope and joy doesn't exist <laughs> in a work yeah. I grew up in North Manchester, you know, there, there's there was there was plenty not to do, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, but you didn't it didn't stop you living. And that's what and that's the thing that Jeremy Deller does really well yeah. as well. Like he he made this documentary, Everybody in the Place, which he made a couple of years ago. I don't know if you've seen it. No. Um it was it I think it came out during lockdown on the BBC. Okay. Um it wasn't commissioned by the BBC, but it ended up going out on the BBC. And it's a documentary about it's about the history of rave but it's also a social history of northern britain in, in the midlands mm. in late 80s and early 90s and the premise of it is that he goes into a school in inner city london i think it's in inner city london and he basically delivers a lecture on the history of rave and the history of social movements and struggle in the 80s and 90s in Britain. Mm. And it's illustrated by clips, like ama just amazing archive of raves in the late 80s. And then like clips of the minor strike and all this other stuff to this audience of kids for whom like this is like far away history. Like you might as well be giving them a lecture on World War One, <laughs> And it's just... I mean, it really is like, I know we're going to talk about some of the films, but like older films, but it really is one of the greatest documentaries ever made. Yeah. Because it contextualizes history in a, it, it makes you see history in a totally different way. It makes you see archive in a really different way. But it's got this framework of 
Jeremy as this as this guy who probably seems like he's 90 to these teenagers, um, giving them some just like getting them excited mm. about the country that they come from, but not the like official history of the country. It's like an unofficial history yeah. of of the nation that I think is really special. Um, it's just really worth checking out and it's really fun as well. Um, so um, yeah, Della, Della really understands all this. Cool. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad I brought him up. I wasn't expecting him to yeah. be such a nodal <laughs> point, but yeah, no, he's, he's fantastic. And I totally agree with you. So to wrap up on this conversation, uh, do you want to tell us about um, maybe work that people can see now that you've produced and, or give us an indication of when people can see the films you've been talking about? I used to commission documentaries for The Guardian. Mm. And if people want to uh, Google Guardian Charlie Phillips, Mm -hmm. that's sort of the easiest way to get to a page that basically lists all the films I was working in. You can also go to theguardian.com forward slash documentaries. I think that link must still work. And pretty much like every documentary on there is a film that I commissioned and exec produced, maybe not a couple of the more recent ones. Um, in terms of looking forward, the US short that I have been producing, which is a film called The Passing, will come out on The New Yorker, probably not till next year. Mm-hmm. And then three feature docs that I have mentioned will hopefully see uh, some light in late 2024, maybe early 2025. It's very dependent on funding, so people are going to have to wait on time, but hopefully that is when they will be out. Well, good. Well, look, we, we hope we can get the directors on them when we get to the, we get to that release stage then and we can talk to them about making it and get their point of view as well. Well, look, let's jump into three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. Um, sounds grand, but it is just about sort of identifying those films. That, it's not to say about favourite films. It's, it's as much about films that hit you or made you see the world differently, however you want to frame it. Or it could just be the film that you saw with your grandma 150 times, you know? Um, I'm not going to judge anybody for how they, you know, hold on to film memories. Um, just for the people who have not heard this font before who are listening in, Charlie's given me three film titles. I'll give him a prompt. We're going to do um, five minutes talking about those films. Uh, and then when the bell goes off, we'll move on to the next film. That sound like it makes sense to you, Charlie? Oh, really? Sounds good. First on the list is described as Britain's only decent punk rock movie. And features a who's who of punk icons, Jane County, Adamant, Jordan, and Toy Wilcox. Although I'm, I don't know whether Toy Wilcox is a punk icon. Uh, although I'm a fan, that's not that's not a slight on her. Uh, I'm talking about Derek Jarman's 1978. Do you want to talk about why that why that film's particularly important to you? Yeah, so Jubilee is a film that I saw when I was probably like 15 or 16. Mm. I think it must have got re-released and shown probably at the Hyde Park Picture House in Leeds. I grew up in Leeds. Mm. I think I saw it there. And I mean, Derek Jarman is my favourite filmmaker of all time. Okay. Like, he is the person who most got me into films. Um, I think he's a genius. He's totally changed my worldview. I love everything he's done. Okay. And what I, what I really loved about that film and about his whole catalogue is how DIY and cut and paste it is and how it feels like a gang of friends putting on a school play. And that is how like Tilda Swinton and other people he's worked with have described it, that it's got this feeling of like, let's do the show right here. Mm. And it's just throwing all of these different elements into the pot chaotically. So in Jubilee, you've got the level of Queen Elizabeth and her kind of magic royal retinue traveling through time to late 70s Britain. And I really love that. Like, I Mm. I don't like the royal family, but I'm really interested in old English culture and I'm interested in magic and I'm interested in English mysticism. Mm. Um, And that was a massive influence of my life. That in itself was a massive influence of being interested in that. But that layer of like, let's get historical figure, let's take them out of time, let's bring them into a place where there's social problems. I I just think that has really influenced the things that I love in the world, which are documentary. I love, you know, like 
social issue documentary. And I know that Jubilee isn't that, but actually like it's documentary style depiction of social breakdown mm. is so present in Jubilee. Like the way that, that Jarman films people doing things like in that film, you've got like the slits basically like burning a car and then sort of hanging a woman <laughs> off the car. It's, it's a lot more jolly than it sounds. Um, it's film documentary style. Like he worked with loads of non-actors. Mm. So that to me, like there's so many amazing documentary elements. There's so much social commentary in there. But then you've also got this magical overview of Elizabeth coming in. And then the stuff like you've got, you've got the record execs, you've got kind of Adam Ant and Toya Wilcox and Jordan singing and wanting to be pop stars. So you've got this sort of constructed stuff, but everything feels simultaneously artificial and really real. Um, and I think that's very true to the punk spirit as well. Like, it's funny because apparently, like, all the punks hated it. Like, Vivian West... Vivian Westwood certainly about, didn't like it. About how much she hated... Like, actually, like, quite a homophobic T-shirt, unfortunately, about how much she hated the film. But, I mean, I love Vivian Westwood, so we can forgive her. But, like, um, I, I think it was too true to the punk ethos. I think the punks were maybe a bit threatened by how this sort of quite posh man who wasn't really part of the punk scene, like, immediately understood what it was all about. Mm. Um, and it's just so fun and it's just so silly and it's just so playful, but it's also really angry and, you know, it's really vicious. Like I mentioned about the kind of burnt out car thing, yeah. um, you know, and that's really vicious. And it is, it's a very like dark image of Britain. Like very. I'm going to say it manages to portray a kind of near dystopia when you could argue it's just what was happening as, as well. Yeah, it, yeah. It's sort of yeah. like it is heightened. And like you say, it is yeah. constructive. But I mean, I saw it when I was maybe nine or ten, like a you know, like a pink triangle film on channel four. And I only saw it like two years ago when I got a BFI subscription. That was the second time I'd seen it. And my memory of it being a child was it terrified the living daylights out of me. Like I because yeah. no, I couldn't comprehend the the styles and the No, I I mean I felt like that scene as a teenager. I like it being scared of it is absolutely the right thing to say. You know, like, I mean, like the scene where Jordan comes out dressed as Britannia and does this sort of operatic mm. version of rule Britannia. And, you know, yeah, it's just like amazing image of the country. <laughs> no, it is. I think, I think, you know, and, and with, and it's, you could argue it's a bit ham fisted in some senses, and, but it's critical of punk, it's critical of the patriarchy, and it's critical of the class system, and it doesn't pull its punches in what yeah. it's saying, and it doesn't pretend to try and do it subtly either, you know? And I think yeah. that's kind of... I imagine that was probably what narked a lot of the... And it's weird, the idea of a punk establishment saying, that's not punk, you know? It's like... It's a, <laughs> there's no irony to that, is there? <laughs> no, no, exactly. There's a complete yeah. lack of self-awareness of to say... Well, you're not punk. We are punk. You know, um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's against the whole spirit. And what? And just, just, to, just before we go on to the next one, also the idea of, like you say, of the sort of almost like amateurish setup, uh, design and production design of thing. When you think that Derek Jarman came from, like, did something like the mm -hmm. production design on the Devils, which is this yeah. amazing visual feast, which is yeah. you know all about the aesthetic. Whereas this is about what can I do with as little, what how creative can I be without having it to be about budget. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, I must admit, watching it as an adult, it was it was satisfying to see that it it was still a powerful film, but it was different. What I think, what one of the things that weirded me out though, watching it as an adult, was where it almost did break. There's a moment where they break between two buildings, and I can see real. It's almost like you can see real London. They're obviously just doing guerrilla filming. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, that's what I mean about the sort of documentary style yeah. of it. That clearly made the whole film sort of on the hoof, mm. and I really like that. And you can see the, yeah, you can see the workings behind it. I like that. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, we're we're now going to uh, draw our attention to one of Britain's most distinctive and original filmmakers. As far I mean, what I what I read is the word visionary is often attached to his work, so. That would seem relevant, given you've picked it as a film that's important to you. I'm talking about Andrew Cotting, and you've picked his film, Galavan, which is about him, his daughter, and his grandmother, I think. 
who oh, went yeah. round the coast of Great Britain. And it's a documentary, so fire away. Where's where where do you see this and how do you how did you find it? Yeah, so so I mean I always say that like Galavan was the single film that made me want to work in documentaries. Amazing. And I've said this to, to Andrew as well. And it it had this massive impact on me because I'd seen documentaries on TV mm. probably, but I'd never seen anything like this mad story of a an anarchic filmmaker taking to his like the youngest family member and the oldest family ma- member on a road trip where they just go and they sort of talk about their family life but really they're just meeting interesting people on the way who are doing stupid things around the coast of Britain who are singing folk songs, doing folk traditions, um, just out there living on the coast, living their lives in, in, in this sort of picture of Britain that I suppose is on like the brink of new labor but still feels really old so you're seeing these like really old people who look like they could have existed in the 40s like andrew's grandmother yeah then also the like this youth culture of the 90s and you've got all these different people simultaneously existing all being filmed in a lot of super a some digital video in this like amazing mashup way where like everything large like like cotting's filmmaking is just incredible because it's all throw up all this stuff see where it lands mash it up together reuse bits bring in random bits of audio bring in random bits of andrew filming himself and it sort of makes this like weird sense even though it's just total chaos and um i love the way that he uses sound i mean that be mind blowing for me because it's all snippets of different material. It's snippets of his voice, snippets of Gladys, the grandmother's voice, snippets of Eden, who is kind of non vocal. So, kind of her like squeaks and sounds um, mixed in with people's songs and thoughts. And it's, it's just crazy, <laughs> but it really works. And it's also really profound as well because it is. Glad, you know, Gladys and Eden getting to know each other in a way that would have been impossible had Andrew not taken them on a road trip. Yeah. And their lives are totally different. Like Eden has a disability. Gladys is sort of old and forgetful. Um, but they understand each other just by having to be on the road together. And it's it's just like a very English road movie as well. Like yeah. nothing that dramatic happens apart from, I think like at one point Andrew is filming out the window and then of the van they're traveling in and falls off and like breaks his ankle or breaks his arm. I can't remember. And that's like as about as dramatic as it. I mean, I mean, I get the impression then that because it's not one I've seen. I get the impression then that it's it, it, it's Andrew in a way making a film like this is is a kind of always on artist. He's not he's not yeah. starting a film and finishing a film. He's no, this is his life. You feel like he they would have been doing this road trip anyway. Yeah, and he yeah, just yeah. Had to a camera with and and um it gets me excited that there was a time when this kind of filmmaking got supported by the bfi and other people mm. where you could just give this crazy artist some money to go off and document what they would be doing anyway but it's also just a brilliant picture of the nation as well um and i and it's all observational filmmaking but spliced together in the most chaotic way what's and the really, what's the power do you think of that idea of like the incongruous audio with the visual you see and say what does you know where, where you where you where... i think it's i think it's like the like the best documentaries i think it captures real life mm. but it captures that like audio and visual overwhelm that i think you get at the seaside like i live by the sea um i'll just finish this thought. yeah no please do, <laughs> so, please do please do please do and um um, it it captures that like overwhelming feeling that you get on a busy day at the seaside where you're getting the sights and the sounds and everything's coming together. But I also think that that is how everyday life feels. I think it can feel quite overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. what he, he captures. 
and and I think in in, in its own way that from a you know from a person who writes scripts like I do, where you're constantly having to invent conflict to make so it can be dramatic, the idea of just filming what you see and then pulling that together into making something that isn't necessarily there's no there's no drama to it it's it's just mm. but it's still got there's still something to see and and i guess the longer we get from 96 the more it becomes that that social history document as well because the it's it's yeah. a snapshot like you say no it's not a picture of a time and it's also a picture of a family have who are a lot older now mm. as well so it's really interesting hearing andrew talk about the film now and about the impact it had on all of their lives God, must have done, and 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 without without once you point a camera at someone, there's always going to be an element of performance, even if they're going, I don't care if you point a camera at me. Yeah. So that yeah. brings its own uniqueness to what's happening while you're on the journey. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, sir, we're on to your final choice, cool. and, and we're now entering the world of uh, well, American production now. Um, mm. David Lynch's fractured fantasy, uh, Lost Highway. Do you want to wear? Talk about where this fits in your in your film loving life. Sure. Film so I mean, obviously, like David Lynch is quite a long way from documentary, yeah, <laughs> from documentary style filmmaking. But I have loved his work since I was a teenager. Mm. Um, I think Eraserhead was probably the first of his films that I saw. But I I really clearly remember watching Lost Highway when a friend of mine was babysitting in this sort of big old house in Leeds. Yeah. And I went to keep him company and we'd got the VHS because it was 1997. So mm-hmm. it was VHS Indeed. of Lost Highway. And when we started watching the film, it was light. And then the light fell as we were watching the film and it got darker and darker around us. Oh, wow. And I just really clearly remember the like you know all the stuff with the guy with the sort of really white face who says like the house right now and all the classic stuff like i remember like my friend anthony was sitting in front of me in a chair and i just remember him turning around (laughs) and me being absolutely terrified that his face would be painted white (laughs) um that you know i was sort of i was into lynch before that film but then i was really into him after that because that like that like world building that he does mm. and that idea that there's this whole other world that we don't know and we don't understand that is going on just through the, you know, through the wall or through the window. And at any moment, something absolutely terrifying could happen and that there could be an alternative you somewhere else. Like, I just love all of those ideas. I just love the way that he can conjure evil and uncertainty and anxiety and like i i think people need like people just need to feel really excited that we live that we live in a time when david lynch is making work i mean, I mean listening to him when you t- when you hear him talk about his practice and certainly when he's talking about film like the idea that he's quite comfortable creating a dreamscape as opposed to a narrative is it's terrifying to me as a writer because yeah. I'm not that confident. But when you hear him talk about it, it sounds dead easy. The way yeah. he, the way he, because he's not, he's not, it's not highfalutin or anything. He's just, he's just mm. saying that you know when you dream, you know the idea of when you dream, the narrative in your head can clash with something else, and it it doesn't confuse you. You just go with it. Yeah, and and it, it's like totally, and it's um, it's all it's like a cliche probably of filmmaking that like you know it's exciting when someone puts a dream on screen on screen Mm. but he really does do that and I think it is easy for him to do this because he can hold so many different visions of the world Mm. and so many different psychological states in his mind and to me his films like make sense like obviously they're like non they're non-narrative and they're non-linear in a lot of cases, but I think they make a sense. They make sense in a way that I think appeals to like something really primal in us. Yeah, of understanding the importance of images and myths and dreams. That I think like really appeals to something deep inside us. Well, do, I mean, I was going to say I think we can spoil a film from '97. Do you think that that 
Red Madison, the Bill Pullman character, is fantasizing about a better life from the point of view he's on the electric chair and he's going to die. Do you think what we're seeing is like a death dream? When it, when it, I think, I think that that is something that David Lynch is teasing us with. Mm. I think he's maybe go, saying, "Oh, this this would be a nice thing that would tie it all up for you mm. and make you feel safe because everything makes sense." Yeah, but I don't. think That's actually what's going on. Oh, right. I think it's, all his films have like layers upon layers, and I think the layer there is like, here's an enticing like little package for you. Yeah. But like in a way, if it was tied up as nicely as that, not that it's very nice. Yeah. There's something really discomforting in being offered this sort of perfect, perfect chocolate to eat. <laughs> and, and and that's what runs through all of his films. Like, you know, he, there's so many scenes that he makes of like a key and a lock. And he loves giving you that thing where an easy solution is going to come along and you can turn you can turn the lock and then everything will make sense. But that never really happens. You never get to that point of resolution with well, him. I mean, also, what, I mean, what he does beautifully is he takes something as tropey as procedural, which is police arrive yeah. on a murder scene and are talking away about, you know, what the murder is and interrogating the suspect. And then you have a moment where Mystery Man says, yeah. says uh, you know, we've met before. No, we haven't. I'm in your house now. No, you're not. Well, call me. And suddenly you're like, whoa, the rug's been pulled. I don't know why this is happening. Yeah, he, he's he's just he's brilliant at undermining genre. Mm. He loves genre and he can undermine genre. And I've actually just been re-watching the first two seasons of Twin Peaks, okay. which I've seen like a million times. Um, because I think it's like the one of the greatest works of our, of our time. I mean, not all of it. Some of season two is terrible, but like as a whole mm. thing. And um, it's just amazing that he like took a, the police crime drama TV series. Yeah. And, and like, and it totally works as a murder mystery, but it's also absolutely not about the murder yeah, in yeah. any way or form. And, and like that is, it's pretty cool. Indeed. Well, look, <laughs> We've reached the end of your three films right. that have impacted everything in your adult life. Thank you very much for sharing those. No memories. worries. No, that was. I really enjoyed it. It's really nice talking about films. <laughs> always is. Always okay, is. But I get very excited about it. <laughs> to be fair, if it's me talking, something's gone wrong. So I'm very grateful <laughs> that you you were as enthusiastic as you are about these films. You, you're you're programming the Folkestone Documentary Film Festival, which will we're recording this on the 12th of September. When is the folks documentary film festival. And um, so yeah, so the doc festival is October 19th to the 22nd. Okay. Uh, so it's over a weekend in Folkestone. Um festival passes are only 30 pounds full price or 15 pounds concessions, which gets you access to all of the 12 programs in the festival. So it's pretty amazing value and you get to come by the sea as well. Fantastic. Well, I'll put links in the show notes and links to your your Guardian documentaries you mentioned as well. Um, and it just gives me to say thank you very much for joining us on the Bullet Fix podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Come on,